sucked, and then we're going to flow this sewage right through it. I what? don't know what, exactly what you're talking about, but we are live over on YouTube, and we're going to get this party started in three, two. What is up, everybody? Welcome to Comic Book Club. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And we are coming to you live from a couple of places on the internet. We are coming to you live from Crowdcast. We are coming to you live from YouTube. We are coming to you unlive, aka dead, over on the podcast yeah. charts. The Deadcast iTunes. is live. <laughs> iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, etc., etc. We are very excited to have you all here tonight. And we have two great guests that, fingers crossed, are going to be able to make it in the stream. Uh, we've been working out some tech issues before this, but it's all going to go yeah. smooth. I, f- I have a good feeling about this. Me too. Islands in the stream, that is what we are. This stream is flowing. Uh, mm-hmm. There's beautiful salmon Patreon swimming up it. Uh, Pete <laughs> is on one today. It uh, was... <laughs> So not quite sure what's happening. Do you have somewhere else to go, Pete? Yeah, I guess. I don't know if you do. know. We do a well, show every go. Tuesday night. Let's get we this should add going. Dis- we should add, add that disclaimer to every episode uh, <laughs> at the top, just to keep people prepped. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Comic Book Club. Pete is on one tonight. I'm Alex. I'm <laughs> Justin. <laughs> and Pete, then you say, I'm on one. And the Marks. Oh, my God. And Pete, <laughs> come on. You don't have to rush through this. It's cool. It's okay. Relax. You're I here. Got, We're going to talk about comics. Up. We're going to have a good time. Think of this as just a, a relaxing spa hour and a half for you. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> just let the the waves of your fr- our friendship go right yeah, through. Yeah, what do you do with spas? Right? They what's it called? Run you over the coals? Like that's a pleasing thing, right? Right. Yeah. So that's Break what we're going to do to you tonight, Pete. We're going to run you through the coals. Patreon, thank you. Ru- run you through the coals. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, I don't know. Run you over the coals? Is that the Rake you over the coals. Rake Alex. you over it's the coals. It's a rake. Choose I was your thinking of run tool. like the fun thing you do where it's like, oh, I'm running over coals. And can you believe yes. they're not burning my feet? A very South Pacific tradition um, that uh, you test your, your strength to what, walk across what are we hot doing? coals. Let's start. Yeah, this is this show. is how we start every show with our uh, uh, embracing of island traditions. That's yes. why I said islands in the stream. That is what we are. Well, sounds like Pete wants to move on from our traditional first section of the show. I, metaphor. I'm not talk. getting that communication from him, but if you are, I'm happy to defer. It's hard to we tell always exactly start breaking Pete down a popular here. aphorism, but I think it's time to move on now. As Pete has so crankily been expressing and clearly is very angry about this, a lot of wonderful people support us on Patreon, which yes. is pretty amazing. Yes, uh, we really is. do appreciate it. Unlike Pete, who is on one tonight. Oh man. Uh, Justin and I at least appreciate it that people do support the show. Oh, here's Mark. <laughs> right. Hi, Mark. This hey, I'm right. glad you got in. Uh, Mark, we're gonna. You can either. <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> kick you out again, and then what? we're gonna welcome you back into the stream. I, I know that was a trial to get here, but um, we have to <laughs> shout some names right now uh, before Pete loses his mind. Yeah. Okay. Or, or if you want to, I'll tell you what. We yeah, told Chad he want... was going to be first. Mark, you had such a hard time getting in. You want to hang out? You want to listen to us say some names? And then we'll... Absolutely. No, let's not take our chances now that I got in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. Okay. So we don't know who this is. Uh, we're going to, you guys don't know who this is. We'll introduce you later. In the meantime, whoever this person is is going to sit here and listen to us. Say a bunch of Patreon names, people that we're going to thank. So let's get into it. Every one of them a hot coal that we would walk across any day. <laughs> Uh, first person we want to thank, we want to thank Aaron C. Hollis. Adam Marks. Adriel Moreland. Elena Fontenot. Amanda Harris. Amy Gonzalez. Andrew Edge. Andrew Primo. Andrew Tillman. Beercat PhD. Benjamin Brown. Charlie W. Christina Jaramillo. Chris Terizzi. Clemens Luer. Curtis LaRock. Demand Ryan. Dan Snope. Daniel Fuentes. Daniel Stay at Home Dad Cabrera. Daniel Warden. Danny Heck. Dennis Scott. Derek Mainhart. Dylan H. LJ. Eduardo Martinez. Emmett Quish. Aaron Dorian. Jeffrey Risher. Gerard de Villiers. Isaac Carter. James Connolly. James Kurtz. Jason Donahue. John George. Jonathan John. Jonathan McCool. Joshua Gibson. Joshua W. Broxson. Catherine Adinson. KC Newhaven. Kevin Grimes. Kevin Kleinrock. 
Kieran Broderick. Cody Thomas. Kyle. Lee Brown. Leewana Thomas. Oh, yeah. Luke. Luke Sink. Mark Carillo. Mark Zeller. Matt Tice. Megan Thigpen. Uh, Michael Tillman. Mitchell McDonald. Nathan Diaz. Nelson Martinez. Nick Grayson. Off-White Savior? Official CBC chef, Brett Macris. Stray Bullies. Soul Art. Oren Dix. Pablo Martinez. Welcome Pedro to the stream. Pedro A. Rangel. <laughs> Pete's Pretty Kitty. Question mark. Primetime Polly G. Rev Mikey. Sarah Schuttenmuller. <laughs> Sarah Schaefer. <laughs> Scott Carpenter. Scott England. Stan Lee. Tamela Rush. The Big Flood. The 12 Bench. <laughs> Victor Perez. Will Buchanan. At Zika's Viral Comics. Thank you for supporting us. Yes. That was much weirder with someone else here. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, thank you all so much for supporting us. Uh, those are all folks that supported the, I believe, $5 and above level over at patreon.com slash comic book club. Other things that we will mention, just to plug, if you're not involved in that, for two bucks and above, we got a cool Patreon Slack that people hang in and out, cool. out in and out. Hang out in all day and talk better and explain things better than I just yes. did over there. We talk comics. Um, we also... talk with a lot of food and drink, as a matter yes. of fact. Yeah. You also get access to our back catalog of podcasts from 2011 through 2020, and including this year, and a lot more things. But we've made it wait long enough. Let's officially kick off the show with our first guest. And again, apologies to our second guest. We're now kicking off <laughs> to being the second guest. who will come later in the show, Chad Sell uh, from the Amazing Cardboard Kingdom b- book. But first, here's Mark Crilly from hey! My Last hey! Summer Hello. with Cass. Hello, Mark. How are you? I'm real good. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Oh my gosh, thank you for coming out. I love this book. This has been out for a while now from Little Brown and Company. This is something we've been talking to people about for the past, I don't know, year and a half or so. But you had a book that came out right in the middle of the pandemic here. What was that like? What was that experience like for you? Oh, wow. Well, yeah, you know, it's uh, maybe less than ideal in terms of, you know, going out and (laughs) doing (laughs) bookstore signings and all that kind of good stuff. But, um, you know, my my life is much less disrupted by this pandemic than a lot of people just because I work from the home anyway. I, I was never going out to an office anywhere. And uh, so I almost felt a little guilty as I heard about everyone's lives being disrupted, whereas I continued sort of sailing smoothly along. Wow. Were you going to say something, Justin? Yeah, I was going to say, can you tell us about the book for people that don't know oh, about sure. it? Because um, I love, this is a book about making art, so it's uh, it feels like doubly timely. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's called My Last Summer with Cass, and uh, it is a story about this friendship between two young women. It begins when they're still children, and they bond over their shared love of drawing. Uh, We get to see several uh, scenes of them in their childhood uh, where they got to know each other uh, every summer at this cottage up in the north of Michigan. And then the the real heart of the story takes place in New York City uh, when they have both become teenagers. And Megan, the main character, the narrator, gets to spend this sort of magical three weeks in New York City where she's uh, exposed to the incredible artistic world that her life casts has entered into and then it becomes you know you you see the sort of stresses to the friendship because they have such different personalities and different ideas of what it means to be an artist um and uh, yeah that's basically it it's a it's a story of a friendship but it also allows me to explore what i have uh, observed as two different types of creative people that you find in the world uh, and to see what happens when they begin to butt heads with their different views of of uh, how the creative process ought to go. So can you talk a little bit about the art process? Because one of the things that I thought was interesting about the book, and I, I say this in a complimentary manner, but the characters seem very disney in a certain way to me. Like they almost <laughs> seem like Disney characters. So reading it, I thought, oh, this is going to be a fun story of two <laughs> women alone in the city. But it's actually pretty, it's a very, if not young adult, uh, adult story of them making their way in the world, finding themselves as artists. So how do you reconcile those two tones, I guess? 
Oh, yeah. Well, that's interesting that you should say that. You know, I, I was a big admirer of uh, the uh, some of the artwork that, uh, especially preparatory artwork that I saw uh, the Disney artists doing for uh, films like Tangled and so forth. And I just thought, um, when I saw these rough sketch uh, drawings, I thought that's the perfect thing for this book that is that is all about the sort of sketchiness and drawing, you know, aspect of this friendship. And so um, that was really what drew me toward that drawing style. But now that you mention it, yeah, it probably could be like a sucker punch of people <laughs> seeing that view, you know, that getting that image. Oh, this is going to be a cute sort of uh, <laughs> story. And then you get into it and, and uh, yeah, there's, you know, there's swearing, which for me was the first. I'd never done a story that had swearing in it. Good for you. And, uh, yeah, you know, uh, 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 Cass is just um, sort of in this avant-garde, uh, slightly grown-up world. Uh, that and Megan, I suppose in a way it works though because Megan is sort of the innocent, doe-eyed, you know, hayseed from the suburbs. Uh, so it sort of fits in a way for us to to start with that view of who she is and then get that shock to the system as she's exposed to this uh, this streetwise world. Well, I, that's what I was going to say. I actually think the the style really matches with sort of the time in your life when you're doing these things. Like you are a wide eyed person when you're just sort of like, I'm going to move to the city. I'm going to be an artist. And then you learn about that as you go. Yeah, and you have your dreams just slowly crushed out of you, right, Justin? <laughs> Why would you say that? I'm just here in a basement next to a lawnmower from the 1950s, um, uh, living my dreams. Yeah, living your best <laughs> life is what you're yeah. doing. Oh, yeah. Living my best life, Alex, my <laughs> yeah. friend. <laughs> I, get, I mean, talking about the pandemic thing from earlier, though, reading this book also gave me a little pang in my heart because, uh, not to spoil a little bit, I think you touched on this already, but when they reunite as young adults for the bulk of this book, it's this wild tour around New York running from one place to another, and yeah. it just feels like... Oh yeah, I I'm in Brooklyn right now, and I miss that oh. so much. That idea of like that night that you have in New York was that something that you were specifically drawing on from your experiences? Well, of course, I didn't know that the the pandemic was coming, so that was sort of an unfortunate <laughs> thing that you and that probably happens with a lot of these books, you know, where you're you're reading it and you're like, oh, this is all the glory days of what was possible <laughs> uh, a year or two ago. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, I did have, this is the closest I've ever come to an autobiographical story. And the character of Megan is not exactly based on me, but I did have experiences of visiting a friend of mine who, uh, his name is John Walter. And he is a little bit like that, uh, cast character and, you know, living in New York city, um, much more into the sort of avant-garde world of modern art and so forth. And so, yeah, that it, I was drawing upon these memories of me going to visit him in New York City and kind of having my mind blown by, um, in a way, just how much more sophisticated his life had become than mine in a lot of ways. The types of people that he was meeting, the types of experiences he was having. And um, there's one page in particular in the book, if you don't mind, let me see if I can find it, because this yeah. this this sort of draw, this is a little tiny moment in the story, but this one really does kind of come from uh, my life and my memory of this friendship. They're in this record store uh, during that first kind of um, glorious afternoon in New York City, and they go into this used record store, and Megan says, they were playing this weird experimental noise music the whole time. Cass was super into it. I was like, this is terrible. But I didn't say that. But I didn't say that out loud. Uh, and you know that is exactly like the friendship, the real life friendship that I have. John is could listen to like the most challenging avant garde music on earth, and I would be sitting there the whole time thinking, I, I just I can't handle this. My brain is not equipped to appreciate yeah. this. 
Throw uh, an acoustic guitar in there, acid <laughs> jazz. <laughs> Give me a little pop book. Come on, help me out. Um, uh, but yeah, and also very true to my personality. You know, I didn't say that out loud. I I didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings. You know, and in a way, that's a big part of the story. The the character who's so bottled up and trying so hard not to rock the boat, not to give anything away, but she eventually reaches a kind of a breaking point in which you're surprised to see that um, maybe she's bottled things up for too much and it all spills out in a, in a pretty ugly way. Uh, so you, you, you grew up sort of as uh, the Megan character, you're saying. Um, yeah, I think, I, well, I, 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 but I... Well, my question is, have you experienced anything on, on the other side? Like, what, what parts of your life did you draw on to get, uh, to get the cast uh, side of it? Well, yeah, again, I was sort of uh, imagining things from the point of view of my friend John. In, yeah, John. Who lived, he always lived in New York City. One time he lived in Newark, New Jersey, and I went to stay just, with him. Just as artistic of a town, they say. Just, yeah, I, I, stayed, I stayed there for a couple of uh, months. Uh, this, I was much older than the characters in this book. I was in my uh, late 20s. And I was trying to get work as a, an illustrator and, and, you know, had some good experiences. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was cer certainly drawing upon a lot of those memories of what John was like and the kind of stuff that he was into uh, as I uh, came up with this story. You know, another thing, though, that it's inspired by, and this is not quite so personal, it has more to do with my observations about different types of creative people. And I'm a big Beatles fan. And I've always been fascinated by this dichotomy between John Lennon and Paul McCartney. Mm. And John Lennon being sort of unafraid to challenge the audience, possibly alienate the audience. Whereas our view of Paul McCartney is being eager to please the audience and, and being a kind of showman. Uh, and, and how those two uh, instincts can kind of butt heads. And uh, so, in a way, these two characters were a little bit based on that as well. And, and there is a scene in the story where they are talking about how important, you know, it is to be honest all the time, right? And Megan is like, oh, you can't be honest all the time. And, and I wanted to present these two different viewpoints. And, you know, depending on who the reader is, you could take Megan's side or you could take Cass's side. They both have a legitimate point of view in that argument. I love that comparison, um, and uh, I always remember hearing about the uh, Paul McCartney writing yesterday, where he said, "Like, yeah, I just woke up and it was there," and I was like, "Fuck you, dude! That's <laughs> no, no way! Get out of here with that! That like apple pie? Like you worked on that a little bit? No doubt. You woke up and it was there. Like an elf put it on your neck while you were sleeping." <laughs> uh, so I guess I'm firmly on the other side. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I've always, I'm, I almost have become obsessed with that. The, the idea of, uh, of how uh, within any different, any creative craft, you're going to find these people who fall roughly into these two different camps. And uh, in a way, that was the key attraction to this story for me was being able to explore. Uh, those two different types. And like I said, not to necessarily, you know, the, you've got the main character of Megan, who's your narrator character, and you sort of identify with her naturally. Uh, but by the end of the story, you know, she's done some stuff that may make you question your allegiance to her. And uh, I tried to be pretty even handed with these two different characters so that uh, there wasn't a matter of one of them being right and the other being wrong in terms of their, uh, their ideas about what a creative person should be and, and how they should uh, go about their uh, process. Now, since you are talking about it, this was inspired at least partially uh, autobiographically based on your experiences with your friend, John, you've called out that it's also uh, based on John Lennon and Paul McCartney. Why abstract the story with two female characters? Yeah, that's a, a really interesting uh, uh, question, and, and I think there is probably an aspect of, of not wanting it to be seen too much, too directly as an allegory right? Uh, for me and my friend, because the, tr the fact is John and I never uh, had big conflict. 
uh, anything like this story. And I wanted to give myself the freedom to to uh, create a more dramatic. You know, I'm a <laughs> I'm a low drama person. So my, if, I, <laughs> if I based this on my real life, the readers would be falling asleep. You know, so I wanted the freedom to uh, <clears throat> sort of energize that. And to tell you the truth, I had just finished this. Um, graphic novel for or series for Dark Horse called Brody's Ghost that had a, a male uh, main character. Uh, and uh, something in me said, boy, I don't want to just start all over again with another male character. Let's flip this around. And uh, I also had been a little troubled by the fact that nothing I'd ever done had um, completely passed the Bechdel test uh, right. you guys are probably familiar with. And I thought, okay, this one, I'm going to make sure that I'll, this story is going to completely pass the Bechdel test with flying colors. Because if you look at it, it's almost entirely female character. All the key characters are female. I'd never told a story like that. And just, I'm always looking for a new challenge, something I've never done before. So uh, that that's really how I settled on that. Well, I also, think before I finish that, though, let me just add one last yeah. thing. And I do think there there is an intensity to a friendship between two young women that is fairly rare, fairly, fairly rarely found between two young guys. I think men have a, a steady friendship and it tends not to erupt into these big highs and lows. Whereas I thought it, it almost felt more natural to have two female characters that, that would be super close and then come into really heavy conflict at some point. Well, I definitely think it works in the book, yeah. and it's, it gets very deeply emotional, particularly by the end. When I was looking around for preview pages to show off, the only scene I found was one towards the end, the one, I'm going to say this very vaguely if people haven't read the book, but the one on the roof just with Megan. And yeah. I was like, I can't show that off. Yeah, don't, yeah. <laughs> no. yeah there's stuff you yeah. can't uh, give away. Yeah. Usually, all my stories are like that. The best thing in it is the thing I can't show anybody because it's a spoiler. <laughs> but it's really beautiful. Like I, yeah. I love also the pacing that you have in the book. That there are times when you have a regular panel structure, but when the characters are opening up emotionally, the pages seem to be opening up as well into double page threads. Is that something that you specifically think about and hit in particular? Oh well, thanks for saying that. Um, I. I guess I have my own instincts for pacing in a story and wanting to make sure that we get quiet moments in there as well as the, the more dramatic ones. I find that I'm really fascinated with reproducing conversation in um, graphic novel format and making sure that we really understand every beat of a conversation and how, in particular, how one character reacts to what the other character has said. And you'll, in my dialogue scenes, you'll very often see the panels that are just given over to the reaction shot before the person says something. Mm. I'm also, I get really geeky and nerd out about word balloons, you know, speech bubbles, the placement of them, what goes into each one, splitting sentences into parts so that you hear pauses in the conversation. To me, that's like acting, you know, and, and this is my moment yeah. to present acting. And I try, I really think long and hard about what goes into each, each bubble and, and in, into each panel so as to convey, make you feel like you're there hearing and witnessing that conversation. Uh, awesome. Now, this that's is awesome. very much off topic, but a guy named Jack Ruby over on YouTube says, I'm not being rude, but I think the guest would kill it as Jack Kirby in a biopic. <laughs> that. Well, that's, that's my calling. Yeah. Get, get into that acting life. Yeah. In, case, in case the graphic novel thing falls through. You get that. Uh, Mark, what else do you have coming up? What else are you working on that you can tease, if anything? Well, thanks for asking. I am in the middle of another one that's a little bit autobiographical biographical. I lived in, uh, in Taiwan for a couple of years after I finished college uh, teaching English. And I've come up with a story that uh, this time does feature a young man as the main character. Uh, but I've come up with a story that allows readers to experience a kind of incredible single day in Taiwan in which it's, I suppose there are some parallels here with Megan's story in the sense that he doesn't know anything about Taiwan. It's, it's practically his first 
a couple of days there. And uh, by way of the plot, he is forced to go out into the world of Taiwan on his own. And uh, uh, if you're on names, we'll have you back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking Quietly. forward to it. <laughs> All right. All right. Mark. Take care, guys. Thanks so much. Yeah, hey, uh, All right. Again, that was Mark Crilly. The book is My Last Summer with Cass. It is available right now from Little Brown and Company. I believe it actually came out in March, so it's been out for a while now. Yes. But we're going to welcome our second guest in, Chad Sell. He's been very patient, so we appreciate that. He is the creator of the Cardboard Kingdom, The Roar of the Beast. Chad, welcome to the show. How are you? Hi there. I am great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, sorry thank about you. the technical stuff early <laughs> yes. on, man. Made to I, do a little switching. It, yeah, who knows? It's fine. I... Um, it was fun seeing Mark talk. I think I saw him give a presentation um, at a library event that I was at once. Oh, like, cool. Oh, cool. Um, but just nice. a small world. Uh, well, cool. We'll have all of these tech issues fixed uh, by, like, I don't know, year five or six of the pandemic, something like that. They'll have all the video <laughs> yeah. stuff. Uh, real that's our target. Thing. That's our target. <laughs> exactly. We're working thing. on it. Yeah, we're working on but it. But let's talk about Cardboard <laughs> Kingdom now. Yes. Uh, I'll say... the. <laughs> Okay, Pete. The... Well, it, was, it was really, uh, I, I just like, uh, it was a fun book to read. We read a ton of comics and just like the, it really jumped off the page for me. And like, not only creatively, but the imagination is a big part of this book that I really appreciated. Well, thank you. I mean, I see it as kind of like um, a mashup of all the comic books, superhero, sci-fi, fantasy stuff that I love and kind of an exploration of like, why do we all love that? And specifically through the the lens of like a costume, like what, yeah. what are we doing when we're playing make believe with our friends? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who, who would you want to be? What would you know? What kind of amazing thing can you make out of cardboard? Um, it's, it's kind of like well, yeah, and I, I I love that because I feel like when you're when you're a kid, when you're the age of the kids um, in your book, you are like sort of you're identifying with these characters and the characters you identify with. I think then informs so much of how you socialize with your friends or how you play with your friends. And then it starts to become maybe a part of your personality in life. And I think to really see those moments um, in this book, I thought was very cool, but we should have you describe what the book is before <laughs> we keep talking about it. Sure. Sure. Well, so um, I have two books in the cardboard kingdom series. Um, Roar of the beast, as you mentioned, just came out in June. Uh, the book, it, it follows a whole bunch of different kids who all live in the same neighborhood each of them has different costumes and characters that they play as in kind of a shared adventure. Uh, and in the first book, each chapter focuses on a different kid as you get to meet them. Um, one reviewer kind of described the first book as almost like the, the Marvel Avengers setup in the cinematic universe of like where you get nice. to meet a character and then you get to see them all team up. Um, and so the, the stories for me are really about kind of how we use creativity both to escape our everyday problems in make-believe, but also to kind of empower yourself or empowering these kids to take on their everyday troubles. Because you see their different kind of issues of identity or family problems at home and how they tie in their heroic alter egos to deal with what they're uh, encountering at home. Yeah. So I'll tell you the first book, the first book in the series, I think it was actually three years ago on free comic book day we went down to forbidden planet and i have a rule with my kids where you can get the free comics but we have to buy you a book as well it's a really tough rule that they absolutely hate i know um, god what a but, are you flexing man. or is that a rule no no no. that legitimately like we free comic book day was dictator. just dictator i am you must dictator. buy more comics <laughs> Yes, they're like, oh, no, now we need to read more. They love it. Uh, but we went to Forbidden Planet, and we were looking around for stuff because I think it was, like, the third or fourth store of the day. So they'd already got, like, their number one things, or their number, like, the things they knew they wanted. And we went to Forbidden Planet, and we asked uh, the woman working there, like, do you have any recommendations? This is what the other things the kids like. And the first thing, she walked right over to the shelf, and she was like, this, Cardboard Kingdom, you have to read this. Read this right now. We're like, okay, we'll get it. The kids read it to tatters. Like, they loved it. Like, every night they wanted to read it. And I think part of the reason for that, uh, and you were touching on, is it's so inclusive, this first book. Like, the first book is really about 
finding out who you truly are is the way that I see it through these costumes. Uh, one thing we can mention, I think graphically that I think you do in the book that is so cool is it flashes between the fantasy kids scenes, the way the kids are seeing them and the real life scenes where they are wearing these very diggy, but fun cardboard costumes where, before we even get into the second book, where did that initial conceit come from? Um, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, I kind of, I love like magical realism. I love layering some like magic and like superpowers or something over everyday life. I just, right. you know, I'm not satisfied with everyday life as it really is. Um, oh. Actually, I years and years ago, I'd actually worked on my other book, Doodleville first. Um, and that in that in that world, drawings come to life. And so I had built out this whole story idea around that. And then actually, then I tried to sell that to publishers you know, 10 years ago, it didn't go anywhere. So then I was like, uh Oh, what do I do now? And I was kind of on this like, creativity being magical role. And then I had this idea for a similar magical realist conceit of cardboard kingdom, where kids create cardboard costumes, and they actually transform into those characters. Oh, no. um, complicated, because it's been like kids superheroes. And I was imagining like these giant epic fights like in their neighborhood and i was just like oh there would be terrible collateral damage <laughs> like this is giving kids a lot of power and responsibility that they actually might not want to wield so i realized one of the key things was like oh they don't actually transform it's it's like you described right um you see what they're picturing when they're picturing an epic battle or what you know when they're casting a magical spell um but you don't actually but there's no actual physical effect of their imagination on the everyday world. It's it's, and I think it, it's much more emotional and intense that way because the kids don't have any kind of magical solution to their problems. Um, it's more about kind of using their their costumes and, and role playing to better appreciate what they're dealing with and what their friends are dealing with, to then just handle what's going on around them. And what's great about that, especially, is I feel like that's how your readers maybe use comics, or that's how any I did anyway. Like it, it was my avenue toward like having a creative uh, story, just like uh, in my imagination, right in front of my eyes. But I got to ask you, why cardboard above like uh, just putting like a, a costume out of uh, out of fabric or something like that? I just I think cardboard is really cool. I yes. I really like that you don't. Most people don't go out and buy cardboard, you know? It's just there. <laughs> As a professional artist, like there are all these kinds of like super fancy art materials and art tools you can use in, in your trade. Um, but what I love about cardboard is that you don't buy it. It's, it's something you would otherwise throw away or recycle. And you know, if you have a little bit of imagination and creativity, you can cut it and shape it and paint it into pretty much anything you can imagine, right? And And even if it looks kind of dinky at the end, it's still, Cool. Like it still just has this like handmade crafty quality. Um, yeah. And I, I tried to capture that in like the costume designs. Like there, there's one character, um, Sam the Goblin, and and I always drew her little horns like kind of crooked. You know, like yeah. kind of yeah. like I kind of imagined them kind of just like flopping around, and and that's like a really endearing aspect of that character to me. Since you Love released it. the first book, have you seen pictures of kids dressing up in the costumes, making their own costumes? Has there been a lot of inspiration there? Yeah, yeah. It, it's so, like, that, that's truly, like, one of the very best things of having a kid's book on the world is, like, seeing kids' own creative takes on Whoa. those characters and on that world. Um, I've seen really awesome recreations of costumes in Cardboard Kingdom, I did one school event where the librarian came dressed up as the sorceress. Oh, oh wow. awesome. um, We actually, a paper craft designer, uh, Costas Natanos, actually created free downloadable paper craft templates for oh, about that's in, awesome. in the book um, on my, that are on my website. Um, and, and yeah, when I've done workshops when I've done like tours and, and school visits and stuff. Sometimes the kids come dressed in their costumes. Um, and sometimes I've been able to help them make cardboard costumes and stuff like that. Like, I'm not actually like an expert cardboard craft. <laughs> but, you know, well, you better get on it. Well, Chad. Yes. Come on, start. I get the scissors. Cardboard better than I can make it. Because, to be honest, one of the logistical issues with cardboard is that it is rather hard to cut. 
Um, yeah. So like, actually, like, <laughs> in reality, a lot of times at, at workshops, it's more like construction paper or like poster board. Whereas like fully corrugated cardboard is like, you can, you need some like special tools or a, an adult to help with that. Yeah, strong scissors. So, I've worked a lot with cardboard, um, so I know exactly. I do a children's, I do a Charlie Brown Christmas live every year, and all this the set is made of cardboard. So uh, this, uh, your books really hit home for me. Yeah, a lot of Hello Fresh boxes in the back there, Justin. We try to hide the brand logos, oh, okay. <laughs> as you do. Now, if the first book, or at least what I, t- a lot of the things that I took away from the first book was that it was about acceptance and about the kids kind of learning how to play with each other and understand their different chi- uh, modes of play. What was the goal with the second book? What was the theme there that you were working with? What sparked that idea? So we had originally just like. So just to um, back up a little bit. So I wrote Cardboard Kingdom with 10 other writers and Mm. uh, each of them contributed one or two different characters and wrote their individual chapters. And I illustrated the whole thing and kind of led the whole project and, you know, was the manager of the whole kitten caboodle. So it it was like such a weird, unconventional approach to making a book. And it was my first book. Um, And so we thought it would just be one book and that would be it. Um, But once I started thinking of sequels, what naturally came to mind was to kind of um, make it a seasonal thing where book one is all about these kids having adventures over the summer. And the the big final chapter is like right before the end of the summer and they go back to school. Uh, So I thought, well, you know, a really a a natural fit for kids dressing up in cardboard costumes is Halloween, like obviously. So once I came up with that idea of making, bringing forward by a few months these kids lives in the same neighborhood um we we made it set before halloween as the kids are kind of getting ready for halloween um and one of the things we haven't talked about about cardboard kingdom is that there there are kind of the hero kids who are like the defenders of the kingdom but also the more mischievous prank minded kids band together as a team of villains called the army of evil and so like Halloween is awesome to them. Like they're planning scarier versions of their costumes, right? Um, and so so kind of a uniting theme of Roar of the Beast is um, what are you scared of? And like when, when there is some like big scary mystery, in this case, a mysterious monster that shows up at night in the cardboard kingdom, how do you deal with it? How do different kids in the same neighborhood deal with it with like a big scary unknown mystery? And how do we see that come about? Like, how do we see them solve a big, scary thing? Um, so, so a lot of my discussions with each of the collaborators in planning Roar of the Beast was kind of talking through how does your character react to the monster? What are they worried about? How do they interpret what the monster is and what it wants? Do they think that it is a real monster? Do they think someone made the monster or that it's out of cardboard or what, you know? Uh, so that's a really fun thing about working with such a big cast of characters and creators that everyone kind of brings a different viewpoint to it and makes for a really interesting ensemble story. Can you talk about juggling all of those characters? Because like you mentioned, there's a lot of them, but I, over the course of the book, you all give them their own do their own arcs, their own things. So how do you plan all that out? Uh, it is a ton of work. It is, complicated. <laughs> um, you know, it, it helps to have each of those collaborators sort of linked to a character or two because they're kind of the advocates for that character. Mm-hmm. So so if, if someone writes a kind of a cheap joke at that character's expense, that collaborator can like speak up and be like, I don't think that they would do that. <laughs> and so it's and it, so it, it's a it's a neat process. It's fun book to book to focus on different characters, to find characters grouping together in different ways um, and finding like new relationships and new dynamics there. Um, it, it involves a lot of calls and emails with my team and sort of really figuring out like, what is at the heart of each character's story for that book. And then trying to keep that clear and, and the, the guiding light, even as then you are kind of like, untangling the knot of like all the different plot details that tie everything together. Yeah. Cool. 
if you since you've done summer and now you've done fall are there plans in the works to also do spring well or winter i, I skipped winter. winter right I, alex yes yeah i don't like you to think in, about winter it's too cold inside. Oh, inside. Even inside. Too long. Even inside. yeah i yeah we definitely have our sights on winter um it just that feels winter like is coming season. And and because kids do get off between you know for the holidays at the end of the year, so yeah. that just seems like a natural time when kids have time to go play, even though it's cold. There's mm -hmm. it's like such a fun, exciting thing to be a kid, and when there's lots of snow on the ground, right? Oh yeah, yeah. holiday that's, break is always. You, know, you need to get some though. of that that fur lined cardboard. Uh, well, that's expensive. what I was going to say. Is snow and cardboard don't necessarily mix? Is that going to be a big plot uh, point to the book? Um, that's a, it's a good spot. spoilers. I was thinking that would be more in a spring thing. Okay. I was thinking mm -hmm. spring would be all about rain, mud, and like soggy cardboard. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can wrap up the saga since you've run out of seasons at that point by all the cardboard get wet. And they're like, well, time to grow up. Oh, grow up. wow. Well, Alex, oh, I don't know if you know, but the seasons actually start over after you finish them. Not so for me. The... I don't want to elaborate, <laughs> but not for me. No, no, I, I like the idea of, of some kids like growing up and like, what does that look like? You know, because there are kids of different ages. There are big siblings, little siblings, you know, and, and, and a lot of the older kids, they're right on the cusp of like when it's really uncool to play make-believe and to like yeah, yeah. your friends. And so I think it's like a very real possibility that some kids would grow out of it because we all grow up to some extent, but then you can still be creative and do mm -hmm. cosplay or you know, well, this is mild spoilers, but both books have big conflicts, particularly towards the end, where there is an older character who thinks this is baby stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be involved in this anymore. And that they're completely won over by the pure imagination. So maybe the way to go is a YA cardboard kingdom book. Throw a little romance in there or something. Oh, wow. oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> I've definitely been interested in YA and romance. Um, it, it feels so weird to take like a kid character and impose mm -hmm. like a romantic subplot on yes. them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was, yeah, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. Don't listen. Uh, this book is great. Uh, what else is coming up for you? If anything that you want to plug Chad. Um, so I, so we are working on more cardboard kingdom, but it hasn't been announced yet. Um, and my other uh, middle grade graphic novel, Doodleville, I just finished the sequel of that and that will be out next summer. Cool. Oh, awesome. Chad, thank you so much for coming on. Again, love the books. My kids, I guess, love them as well. Uh, <laughs> we appreciate your time and good luck. Looking forward to the third volume. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, All right. Take care. Good night. See you, Chad. Bye. All right. There we go. That was Chad. Oh, Sell. The Chad. Book is, is called The Cardboard Kingdom, The Roar of the Beast. It's out now from Penguin Random it's House. Fantastic. It's very good. Very fun. Definitely pick it up. And folks, it is time to move to our next section, which is my favorite section because you will make it up. It is your audience question. Yeah. And for audience questions, all you got to do is drop a question in the comment section over on YouTube or an ask a question over here on Crowdcast. But before we do that, folks, it's time to pay the piper. That's the expression, right? Well, yeah, you, you have a master. It's rake the piper. Rake the rake piper. Rake the piper. We got to rake the piper over the coals with this week's sponsor, Manscaped. Attention listeners across the galaxy, all the way from Australia to Houston, do we have a pube problem? If so, our friends at Manscaped have cleared you for takeoff with the fourth generation and brand new lawnmower 4.0. Kick your pubes to the next planet. Which is ah. very aggressive. With the Performance Package 4.0, the orbits in your pants will feel like you're in zero gravity when you use the best tools for the job from the leaders in male grooming. Join the 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped and get your rocket ready for takeoff by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus three free shipping with the code FANSIDE at 20. Justin, you want to take that next paragraph? Sure. This used to be such a more of a scenic thing. <laughs> uh, I guess our roles have changed. So inside this package, you'll find their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, Weed Whacker, Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Toner, Performance Boxer Briefs, and a travel bag to hold your whole solar system. And I'm speaking specifically about the genitals there. Um, 
first scheduled for liftoff, the lawnmower trimmer. This spaceship is here to guide you on a journey to trim your body, Paul's butt, and even Uranus. I'm so sorry. This fourth generation trimmer also features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents. Pete, you know all about those thanks to their advanced mm-hmm. skin safe well, technology. Before, hold on, just to clarify, Pete knows about that because he used to use other things other than Lawnmower 4.0. That's exactly and he right. He basically cut his dick clean off. Right? <laughs> That's <laughs> something he's talked about privately to us <laughs> and not publicly until this very day. And uh, we don't have time <laughs> to turn it over to Pete for Pete's unarrowed corner. Uh, but uh, we, we <laughs> yeah, Pete, tell us about that day when you cut your dick clean off. And remember, this is an ad, so it's definitely in continuity. <laughs> Pete? No? I'm drinking. <laughs> uh, the okay. Love More 4.0 also has a 4,000K LED spotlight. You can turn on and off when needed for a more precise shave throughout your travel across the universe. The Performance Package 4.0 also includes the Weed Whacker, which is like having... A little astronaut to chop your worst weeds up top in your nose and ear. A dream I've had for years. <laughs> That's the thing everybody wants. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code FANSIDED20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code FANSIDED20 at manscaped.com for a clean trinity and beyond. Your space balls will thank you. Yes. There you go. There's Great our... team effort there. What the three of us in? all working together. What yeah, wait, I want to tell you guys a story. This is actually relevant to the ad, kind of, and I felt so uh, stupid today. So, Is this a story about your balls? No, it's actually about my face. So I went and uh, I needed to get a new Ooh. beard trimmer because my beard trimmer broke. So I went to Amazon and I was looking at beard trimmers. There's one that has like four and a half stars with 60,000 reviews. So I was like, this is probably fine. It's 20 mm-hmm. bucks, whatever. I'll, I'll grab it. But I was curious. I went to, you know, they have the frequently asked questions section. The first question was, does this work downstairs? And I was like, what? Why would somebody, why wouldn't it work downstairs? Is it, is the... Like, my Wi-Fi is bad downstairs. Is it Wi-Fi powered? And I sat there for a solid minute. Wow. Being like, I don't understand why it would stop working when you brought it down. Why does it only work upstairs? I don't understand. You went to Cornell. You went to Cornell. You need to listen to all of our Manscaped ads on That's the thing. I felt stupid for so many different levels of reasons at the the end of that. But anyway, Uh, eventually I figured it out. A couple of quick, it's crazy. Our comments really increased during the Manscaped ad portion, but let me just shout out a couple of these real quick. Uh, Tall People Suck says, seems like the Sizz, that's me, would be all over this as a Headlopper fan. Thank you for identifying me as the Headlopper fan on the podcast. Oh, come on. You are 100% correct. No, uh, you've been on that book since the beginning. Come on. Exactly. I have been What's that other heads. book you like? Murder Falcon? <laughs> Murder Falcon. I'm you know, and I've been a big book hunter fan for a <laughs> long time. <laughs> wow. That's a deep cut, dude. That's right. Um and then one other comment uh, from Derek Mainhart. Here's the thing. It's not even a real sponsor. It's just something they like to do. <laughs> and that, to me, is really the conspiracy theory I want to believe the most. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go to what you're drinking. Now, I want to give a shout out, actually, before we go any further. I did not make this week's cocktail, which I feel very oh, bad about. You. I'm so yeah. sorry. I just did not feel up to it. But we did have a great suggestion. This was from Will on our Patreon Slack, he suggested a Hemingway daiquiri, which is three ounces of rum, half an ounce of Luxardo maraschino, yes. three quarters ounce Liqueur. grapefruit juice, and three quarters ounce of lime juice. Sounds great. I definitely want to try it out. I am not drinking that tonight. Uh, instead, I got myself a little Snake Dog. Snake, snake dog. dog IPA. Classic but- substitution is a Snake Dog. <laughs> and for those of you who haven't signed up for the Patreon, Let's just say we just we talk about comics and everything, but it's truly become a recipe and cocktail. Uh, oh, hey, I love it. Of, it's great. Too. Everybody's of showing off their best recipes and drinks and stuff. It's the fun. food flexing is bananas on that show. That's good. Yes, there is we are there is comic chefs. book chat. I will say just as a little preview, a bunch of the questions at least here on Crowdcast definitely come from stuff we were discussing on yeah. the Patreon Slack today. But Justin, what are you drinking? Uh, I also. Uh, I love that Snake cocktail. Dog? I know. Nope. Uh, I love the cocktail, the um, Hemingway <coughs> um, daiquiri. I just didn't have the stuff either. Uh, but so instead, I am drinking a 
Grippa Grapefruit IPA from Cisco Brewery on Nantucket. One of my favorite beers that I just restocked recently. Definitely check it out. I'm about to finish this one, and I'm going to drink a Narragansett I found in a cooler that I left outside for multiple months. So right. look forward to Ooh. me trying to taste how this tastes. Man, Don't Justin, you know they Don't. say if you die on the podcast, you die in real life. Did you know that? That's absolutely not true. I die on the podcast every week. <laughs> That's, true. That's true. Pete, what are you drinking? Oh, man, I'm drinking uh, vodka and lemonade. You know what I mean? Sometimes you take two oh, things you have. Pete, Pete you before, you, before you go, say don't don't spoil the recipe. Share the recipe with everybody in the Slack. <laughs> For your vodka and lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go over to some questions. We have a bunch here. This is from Jolene. With the recent coming out of Tim Drake and Kitty Pride as bisexual, and of course the shitty reactions of assholes, how long do you think it'll be before a previously established character comes out as trans and what are some fears mm. of the handling of such a story so uh, there's a lot of things i think to unpack there the yeah. first couple of things that i throw out and this is something that mind you is very easy for me to say but generally as a cis straight white male but ignore the trolls like they're a very loud vocal minority most of the time and they're awful people and it's hard to ignore them but it's and also the, the media covers the troll side a lot, just as the reaction to the reaction kind of a thing. So it is hard to ignore them. But yes. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. Thank you for chiming in. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. It's It becomes predominant and outsized in terms of the conversation always with these things. But frankly... I think with these large corporations, they're not going to make these moves unless they've been focus group within an inch of their life, you know, or at least like talked about internally, particularly with a DC comic book with something like Tim Drake coming out. That's going to be vetted all the way up through Warner Brothers because that's part of the Bat family. That's not something that just, you know, a writer goes rogue or an editor goes rogue. That's something they're going to talk about quite a bit. So they're going to back this stuff up. There's always going to be exceptions where they have... I don't know, like a Charlie Kirk or whatever starts tweeting about it and then it becomes a whole thing in the media and they have to say something about it or shut it down in some way and that sucks. But my point being, the large majority of the time, they've already vetted this through the entire conversation and then that's it. Like, that's how it is until I guess somebody tries to reverse it. To talk about the trans character thing, I think that's going to come eventually because it yeah. has to. And it should, but same sort of thing. People are going to be terrible about it. It's going to be a whole thing. They're going to talk about yeah. it. I don't know how you ignore the trolls in that case, because frankly, whoever it is, it feels like probably a bigger deal in terms of society than the Tim Drake reveal. But at the same time, you just got to like trust in the storytelling and trust weirdly. I think this is the one case where you can kind of almost trust a corporation to sort of have your back there just because they've already made the decision. Well, well also, and like, even if it I'm, takes a long time too to get to that, like there there are a ton of stories that are that feature trans characters that in the comic book world and they're more more coming all the time. It's just maybe not from the the main corporate corporate uh, comic book lines. I I think also a main concern is how uh, how organic is it going to feel? How much a part of the story is it instead of somebody trying to be like Oh, the corporate wants to do us to do more of this. Let's just horseshoe it in there, and you know what I mean. Like, uh, hopefully, it's story focused and kind of gets to explore cool parts of characters and open things up a little bit. Uh, um, but yeah, uh, sorry, I just wanted to bring up Stray Bullet over here in the comics uh, comments. Says, "Who's the character from Supergirl? That's Dreamer." Uh, played by Nicole Maines, I believe, and she's trans. But I think the question here is a character coming out as trans, essentially. Um, so, yeah, I absolutely think that would happen. The other flip side, and we've talked about this a lot on the show, is just the handling of it. You know, I think comics have gotten better and smarter about this thing, this sort of thing across the board, but they're still, particularly if we're talking about specifically DC and Marvel, there's still only a certain way they could do it. Like, there's a lot of discussion about the Loki moment uh, in... Uh, in the TV show, Loki. yeah, Loki. Yeah, Loki. <laughs> what was that called? Yeah. Was that Loki? <laughs> yeah, Loki. The word you're looking for is Loki. Uh, but that sort of thing, like I think uh, I've sort of come around and soured on it a little bit because it's the part of this pattern of Disney doing like 
check out our exclusively gay moments with our characters. Isn't this a big deal? And it's like, yeah. you know, you've had like five of these go a little harder on it. Like just, just say the word for God's sake. Well, yeah, exactly. Like go harder at it or like, don't trumpet something that you're not actually doing that you are right. sort of like uh, Jerry rigging into being that <laughs> like be, be better or don't brag about how you're better. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so anyway, I think, I don't know. There's a lot more probably to discuss there, but um, it's going to happen at some point. It's going to be an issue. Let's focus on the positive people instead of the negative people as much as possible. This yeah. is from a King McCarty. Um, my kid is super into the Hulk, but I don't know a lot about him. What books are a good place to start? Preferably where he's not eating people. He's super young. <laughs> well, definitely not the current run. Yes. Uh, which yeah, is do not on. do current. Yeah, the yeah. Immortal Hulk is like all about body horror and true uh, scary shit. So definitely not that. Yeah. Like uh, you, if the, your kid is young, an all ages Hulk story. I'm trying to think what the title was from a few years ago that was an all ages. I would say Greg Pox run on Hulk is uh, really great. Um, you know, it's it's got some love stories, some battle stuff, but it's you know, it's pretty all ages and pretty amazing. And even if it's not all ages, I think you your child would appreciate it. You You're know? talking about Planet Hulk and World War Hulk. Are yeah, yeah, I'm talking about. There. The, this kid, however old they are, should witness somebody being so angry they're s standing on the front of their ship, mm -hmm. just shaking their fist, being like, I'm going to get you. I mean, I I don't know. I, I read The Hulk. Like, that was one of the things that I was super, super into uh, when I was first reading Marvel comics. So a lot of, I've talked about this before, but like, I don't even know if it has a name or it's collected somewhere, but the Crossroads thing where he's banished by Doctor Strange, I think feel like Roy Thomas did it maybe, but maybe I'm making that up. But right. he's banished there and he goes to a bunch of different worlds. That's where he meets Drilla, right? And falls in love with her. But that's yeah, this very later. Yeah, this is very pure. That's kind of like the childlike Hulk. So I think that's why it worked for me and that's why I identified it with. He was just this very pure, wide eyed Hulk that was going to these different worlds, but get angry and then he'd calm down and fall asleep and then he'd go somewhere else sort of a child like hulk like you're saying uh in the comments we've got totally awesome hulk um being shouted yeah. out sort of a recent run which i think is yeah. is sort of a younger hulk uh i wouldn't call it like a book for kids but it, it is a the hulk is not nearly as aggressive it's a smarter hulk it's a hulk that uh whose powers work a little bit differently so it's not all about anger um yeah but so that's i maybe a good record also, Pablo D. Martinez is right in the comments there. The the older Bakshi issue stuff, like the Herb Trimpy Hulk stuff, was really great. Yeah. Uh, there we go. This is from Ben the Border Collie over on Crowdcast. HBO Max announced a Fiona the Human and Cake the Cat show today. This may be a question just for Justin, but what other Adventure Time spinoffs would you be excited to see? I mean, I've been loving the movies. Um, the Fiona and Cake, I think, is great. To be able to really get into that is super exciting. Um, any side character, the, the creative team, the wide group of people behind Adventure Time, can I feel like they can really handle any aspect. Like, I want to see a show that's all about the wizards. I want to see a Peppermint Butler show. I think we're getting a Peppermint Butler movie coming up, which ought to be interesting. Um, uh, just in a, an Ice King uh, a standalone um, a movie or series, like um, those are just some some faves. Uh, I mean, I'd like to see uh, a the so whole saga of uh, of Marceline and like her life sort of laid down together as one like epic mythology of of ooh. I think that would be awesome. Anything that could really. Be, I would like to see a comedy series that is just the fun stuff of Adventure Time, but also something that's that's sort of hard fantasy mythology because the series can do all of that shit. Yeah. And Justin, if you had any free time, your fanfic of this would be sick, man. Yo, dream job. Except the writer oh. on that show doesn't do much because the storyboard artists are the real fuel there. Whoa! Oh, sick wow. bird, bro! Lame I mean, it's, that's man. not a... That's just Throwing what the way it works. Fire. It's not even oh. a, that's not even a burn. Oh shit! It seems like a burn. Oh shit! You're coming not right for them. Pendleton Ward, where are you at? Oh. He's <laughs> from. I don't, I don't know where he's at actually. Julian Lobato says, "Who's everyone's favorite comic character, 
This is over on YouTube. Who's everyone's favorite comic character and who would be your dream team writer artist for them, dead or alive and retired or working? I'll tell you, it would be hard for them to write the character if they were dead. Get out of here. Oh, my God. <laughs> Save that Shit. for when you go you upstairs. Fucking... Sorry, Alex, yeah. that doesn't work downstairs. <laughs> That's not a downstairs <laughs> that work downstairs. <laughs> go back upstairs, Cornell. Uh, yeah, and for any new viewers of the show or new listeners of the show, do we want to talk about just very quick favorite character and dream team working on them? Uh, let's do it because maybe it's changed. We haven't maybe. answered this question in a while. I don't know. Uh, I'd still say Cypher. Oh my <laughs> yep. god! And I'll tell you what. I think you know we're going to get into this in a little bit with the news about Jonathan Hickman and the X Men. But I'd love to see Jonathan Hickman tackle a Cypher solo title because we're doing such an amazing job with him over the x-men title i think that would be neat i think now is the time the fans demand it mm, i don't know about the time being right now uh, but i do think cypher is if we ever do get the um rest of jonathan hickman's um x-men story cypher does seem to have a role yeah absolutely justin what about you favorite character dream creators? my favorite character um uh, throughout time is uh, starman um the dc comic character um the original, uh, the James Robinson, uh, he, he sort of wrote the whole thing. So I, I, he is a writer, is great. Um, that was sort of his best work of his career, I think. I'd love to see someone like uh, James Tynan. Uh, I know he's not really doing a lot of um, <laughs> uh, comics for the old, uh, the old DC gang anymore, but um, I'd love to see him get on that title. Uh, maybe Gail March on the art, someone like that uh, would be cool. Pete, what about you? Um, ah, I, I, there's, it's really depends on what kind of uh, mood I'm in, who my favorite is. Um, but, um, right now I would say I would love to see, uh, uh, more X 23 in the world. I would want to see, uh, um, you know, Miko, uh, you know, and different, I don't know. I mean, there's so many, like Chris Baccio is like one of my favorite artists, but I'd love to see different stuff uh as well but um i don't know there's it that question blows my mind because there's so much great stuff that we get to read and experience and it always feels weird because if i pick one love i'm hurting somebody else or something like that yeah you know? they'll definitely That's hear not about true. it they'll hear about it yeah it's yeah, not true upset. to pick i mean hulk's gonna hear i didn't mention the hulk uh punisher's gonna get upset you know we I have mean, a it's comment just like, from uh user frank castle over here on youtube that says pete how could you yeah, <laughs> this is this is he Matt. follows up saying this is undoubtedly the worst thing that's ever happened. To me. <laughs> wow. Yeah, see, wow. that's exactly what I'm talking about. It's exactly you really broke his about. heart and he was <laughs> yeah. a stable person up until that. Moment. Yeah, <laughs> up until that. That's it's uh, you break people's hearts. It's 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 hard. He just Let's sat go. down to watch Comic Book Club at a beautiful picnic in Central Park. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and it was ruined yet again. Get out of there, Frank. Get out of there, Frank. Frank. This one ties into what we were just talking about. This is over on Crowdcast from Ben the Border Collie. Do you think Marvel will eventually tell Hickman's plans second and third act of his X-Men epic? If so, do you think he'll be involved still? So a quick review of the news here that came out kind of late today over on Entertainment Weekly. Jonathan Hickman is finishing up his run on X-Men with Inferno, which is the upcoming crossover that's going to be happening. And he's going to move on to some other big Marvel project. He's not leaving solely for Substack or anything like that, though he is doing some Substack projects. But Who he talked it? seemingly pretty openly about his X-Men plans there. And he said he had planned a three-act story for X-Men that he thought would take approximately three years, but he wasn't 100% sure. House of X and everything that came out of that was all Act 1. And everybody that has been writing so far since that relaunch has been writing in Act 1 of X-Men. And he asked everybody, he said, uh, I think it's probably going to be about time to either do the second act or me to go do something else. How are you guys feeling about this? And the current team all said, oh, we love working in this. We want to keep doing this first act here. And so he said, okay, so I'm out, and I'm going to go do other things. So that's the basis of the news now let's get over to Ben the Border Collie's question. Justin, what do you think? Are we ever going to see that second and third act of his story? Uh, and do you think he'll be involved, if so? Uh, yes, I think he's staying at Marvel. The way the announcement was that he's working on some other large event there. So it's like, I think he's going to go do that. 
And then I bet he will come back in six months after that is sort of all done and to do the second and hopefully third acts here. Um, it's in, it's an interesting announcement. It is sort of uh, you never want to see in any sort of creative enterprise. Like, let's just do donuts in the first act for longer, <laughs> which is notably <laughs> the not most fun act. Yeah. Uh, so like I, I and I feel like the Xbox in general feels like we need a big move. Maybe Inferno will actually do that. Um, Inferno is supposed see. to burn X Men to the ground. Well, I don't think it's going to do that. Yeah, I don't, particularly given this announcement and the framing of it, I don't think it's going to change everything forever necessarily. But yeah, it's, I don't know, I find it frustrating. And part of the reason that I find it frustrating is just because of the nature of comics. And I think this is what Ben the Border Collie is getting at here is that the longer this stretches on, the more things that are going to happen in the X Men universe that potentially make it harder for Jonathan Hickman to hit whatever point he wants to hit, or somebody does something that contradicts it that changes his plan. And that's the nature of ongoing comics, but it worries me because this story is so big and so bold. I want to see him tell the story he wants to tell. Well, and I also think the announcement's weird, too. Like, don't tell us you're not doing a thing that we all want. Like, if you're stepping away, like, be like, hey, I I'm just stepping out to do this event that's going to be great for the rest of the universe. These guys are going to tell some stories, and then I will come back and do more. Like, the fact that he was like, oh, I have what you want coming. It's just not coming for a while is a disappointment. Yes, I agree. And Pete, the good news for you is that means the status quo for the X-Men is going to take even longer. So there you go. Pretty cool. Pretty, pretty cool. Let's move back over to YouTube because we have a lot of questions over there. This is from Isaac Carter. Question. Halfway through the year now, what comic do you have as your number one comic of the year? Ooh. Number one comic of the year. What do you got, fellas? What's at the top of the stack? Um, uh, I... I, I don't know. I just feel like because we read something today that I really enjoy. That's what I want to trumpet, but that's very Fairweather fan of me. Yeah, the, Pete, don't have recency bias, but I will say um, uh, Homesick Pilots is... That's better. what I was going to say, motherfucker! Oh, weird. I, how did I know that? Uh, I could just read you like a book. I was going to um, say that, and I was like, oh, dude, you're just being the guy who's like, I just read this thing. I, I talked that book up from the jump um, as oh, well. Uh, we Pete, Pete has also come on board to like it. Uh, that's one of my faves, Department of Truth and um, The Nice House by the Lake um, mm. have been uh, to, to give to uh, James Tynan books um, some nods. Those are both very big faves for me. Yeah, I think James Tynan stuff is all up there in contender for top 10 at the end of the year. Uh, Wind is also great. Oh, yeah. um, something is killing the children has been awesome with this current arc. Mm -hmm. The other one that I wanted to call out that came top of mind because ice cream man was our number one last year is yes. ha ha, which is W Maxwell Prince's mm -hmm. anthology that he's doing right now, which is weirdly more positive though. Still being very dark, uh, but really, really good. I'm sure there's a lot more things that I'm forgetting. I've got a couple to say real quick um, in the Tom King verse. I've really been enjoying how Rorschach has come together, despite it being a little dense uh, and opaque at the top. I really like the way it's coming in. Uh, Adam Strange, um, the new uh, Supergirl series I've been really enjoying yeah, yeah. Um, a lot as well. So um, these big creators are doing great work. Yeah. Beta Ray Bill, I want to give a shout out. Um, and the uh, I can't believe I'm blanking on the night one with the grandma that I've been loving. Night grandma. Night grandma. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good night grandma. <laughs> it's a kiss, a, a kiss for grandma by P. LePage. Very sad. Sad uh, book. This is from Straight Bullet. Wait, no, no. What's, the, uh, what's it called? It's like Once future? in Future. Is Once in Future. Thinking? Thank you. Night Thank grandma. You. Yeah. I don't know how I knew that based on that. <laughs> no, that's that's I knew that too. Well, that's what he was future. clearly yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. But night grandma's a ghost that visits you, right? Uh, every night, <laughs> night grandma's coming tonight. <laughs> yeah, if I was good. Uh, Mark Crilly made me miss. This is from Stray Bullet. Mark Crilly made me miss NYC, so I'm feeling nostalgic. What's one of your favorite going out in New York City stories, CBC related or otherwise? Oh, wow, oh, great boy. question. Well, the night 
Zalvin puked in the cab was a famous going out story for sure. Yes, it was. I don't know if we've told that story on this podcast a million uh, times. Yeah, have we? Um, that was very fun. I'll definitely always remember looking at Alex and being like, "Oh, this dude's gonna puke," and he's getting <laughs> in that cab right now. And I did. And then and he I did. did. <laughs> he definitely yeah. did. Um, what other nights have we gone out and had some wild adventures? I mean. When we were doing our show uh, downtown in Chinatown, I feel like oh, us yeah. like connecting with that bartender. Oh my god! Um, yeah. Who would always <laughs> buy random shots? Um, getting Vanessa's dumplings was always oh, fun. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, yeah, just to elaborate about the bartender. So we used to do the show at this bar in Chinatown. The bartender Fontana's Fontana's yeah. nicest guy. So nice. Yeah. Like wonderful terrible bartender awful bartender <laughs> awful maybe bar- one of the worst Wait, I mean, come on, come on. tuesdays tuesday early evening is not a fantastic shift uh, no. let's no doubt there sure but awful bartender but also when we get off the show he'd be like shots shots yeah. and it's the nicest we, so nice guy. so nice and we do shots and just sort of hang out there for a while yeah. and chat and sometimes it's a good time too long good time yeah. uh cool there you go i don't know if that completely answered that this i would say though that yeah. like one of my like favorites uh was uh the night where uh oh my god why am i so horrible right now being able to pull up names um justin uh, joe grandma. joe night hill grandma. joe hill's hanging out getting drunk with us and he's telling us stories yeah. about like growing up uh with stephen king and his, his dad and like how it was just like one of those drunken like after the show things where it was like now we're getting really amazing stories and we felt like uh i at least did felt like a little kid around a campfire and he was just like telling stories after stories and they were really amazing i mean one more i think was it our first anniversary show where we had uh bill Hader, seth myers oh, yeah. um we had bendis uh brubaker joe quesada Joe Quesada and uh, Jeff Loeb, right? And Should Jeff Loeb. I? Yep. And Jeff yeah. Loeb. And we were like, this is, oh, we're, this is very cool. We're very cool. I think we all wore little suit jackets. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If I remember correctly. And then did the show. It was super fun. And afterwards, we all went to a bar and they all talked to each other. <laughs> and we were sort of near there, but they were all fans of each other. So they yeah. were just geeks out to talk to each other. We were like, we are. A part of this conversation. <laughs> nope, mate. Nope. And uh, then Bill Hader and Seth Meyers got a comic book out of that. 100%. Like, very directly, they got to write a Spider-Man comic book off the of The Short Batman Halloween, show. the Short yeah. Halloween, I believe it was called, was definitely a direct result of a late night bar convo with us standing slightly nearby. Uh, <laughs> but the first time Jimmy Palmiotti took us out drinking after a show, that was a hell of a night. Great that guy. guy. Yeah, I was throwing it back and telling us crazy, crazy stories. Yeah, it's always fun when we get some uh, some people, some creators that we love who actually want to hang out and, and chat. Yeah, yeah. yes. Um, and it's not New York based, so we won't talk about the cruise and how we <laughs> really cut loose with um, Brian Azzarello. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. Remember um, that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was fun. That was crazy. Uh, Nelson He's Martinez, let, let's move to this question here. Nelson Martinez over on YouTube says, how do you guys like how White Lotus wrapped up and sticking with HBO Max? Are you guys excited for Titan season three or not so much? Um, I thought White Lotus ended very strong, especially a show in the middle that was a little bit uh, wandery and sort of like, oh, where, what is this even about? It's one of the rare shows where the last episode gave full context to all the early episodes especially what happened in the first episode in a way that really hits so much harder. I thought it was great. And Titans is also a show. (laughs) Yep. I have been so surprised about all the backlash against White Lotus because I felt like the last episode was so consistent with every episode. I don't know what you expected from the show. Like everybody, frankly, who has come out and spoilers here, but everybody has come out and been like, I can't believe that the servers didn't win over the rich people. It was like, what show were you watching? Exactly. When, when was that indicated at any point that was going to happen? 
Also, the point, if you've ever watched other Mike White's uh, work, like he's not about that. He's not about having a winner. Or having, it's not about, it's about having oh. us walk away and think about it a little bit. Uh, because I think what he's doing is pointing to something that is the way it actually happens. I get it. Um, Mike White, White Lotus. Now it makes sense. It That's accurate. I know you're joking, but he gave an interview with Vulture, which is really yeah. good, where he was very honest about a lot of stuff. And it really was partially based on. Wait, did you do that interview? Is that why you said the interview is so good? No, it was a very good interview. (laughs) That you were like excellent interviewer and great writer named Catherine Van uh, Adirondack. I think that's how you pronounce her name. Van Adirondack. Wow, that is she holds the mountains. Wow, wow. I'm definitely pronouncing her name wrong. But she's a very good interviewer, uh, and it's a really good one. Uh, So you should check it out. I thought that was great. Titans. I watched all of season one i think and started to watch season two and was like i can't do this anymore i'm out i'm sorry yeah I, i'm done and i got this is a nut flex pete but i did get like half of season three early and it sat in my inbox and i was like i can't do this to myself i have better things to do with my time than watch titans wow it's just so i don't know it is not my thing it's so like edgelord DC and that's my least favorite type of thing. But I know a lot of people like it, so I'm glad you do. This is from Edward <laughs> Doherty. In the spirit of X Men legends and old stories that were left unfinished, what creators would you like to see return to a title to complete their story? The Gay Men Miracle Man arc and what prematurely mm. ended to current titles do you think people will want to see finished in twenty years time? Uh Saga? I'd like Saga to wrap up. That yeah, would be great. That's, that's Can happening. we do that, please? That's okay. a purposeful break. Uh, so that's not, okay. that's definitely not prematurely ended. Um, uh, that's, a, th- I mean, a f- few things I think are prematurely ended in the way that it, uh, that it was back in the day. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess I would like to see more Peter David Hulk uh, back from the, the Pantheon days. Um, I really like that run. Um, I mean, this is a recent one. I think we were talking about this last week, but I was very bummed about the ending of Runaways, uh, Rainbow Rowell's mm. Runaways. That felt like she had a lot more story to tell, and I'm sure just people were not buying the story. That's or... a, a great call because I yeah. also really enjoyed that book. Yeah, I want to. I want to see more of that. I mean, I don't know, like, if there'll be a huge demand, but that would be awesome. Uh, I mean, Far Sector uh, Green Lantern, I think we oh. will get more, but like, it's a How shame. How could you that, not? That's what I'm saying. It's a shame we're Far just Second, not getting that book right now. We should just take over, and we don't we don't use the word Green Lantern anymore. <laughs> you, you just say Far like Sector. Green Lantern. It's crazy. Uh, all right, we got another one here. Uh, let's see, this is over on YouTube. Also, just a comment from Isaac Carter. Calls out The Nice Grandma by the Lake it was a good book this year. Hmm. Definitely. Very. Uh, Pete has said, and I think this quote will be on the trade. Very kissable grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I did not say that. So we had a couple of questions here, Justin. I know you were not here last week to talk about this, yeah, but about you all here, the Substack yeah. stuff that's yes. going on, and more things have developed since then. Uh, for those of you who haven't been paying attention to the news, there's a lot of comic creators that are going over to Substack and doing various projects over there. James Tynan is leaving Batman to do it. That was kind of the big bullet point, but Scott Snyder is doing a couple of projects. Uh, Scotty Young announced that he's doing something over there. He's bringing back I Hate Fairyland and I think one or two other projects. And today, Donny Cates and Ryan Stegman announced that they're going to be doing an imprint over at Substack, including a bunch of titles. So, Justin, what's your take on all of this news since we haven't chatted with Yeah, you Justin. Yet? Yeah. What's your wow. fucking very, take, man? Very aggressive. I mean... To me, it makes total sense. It's you, it feels like the creative path for a lot of people. You work your way up through the system, you do great work, you become recognized, and then you're like, here are the projects I want to do that are my original projects. So it feels like a nice iteration. I think it helps to move people through the system and we'll get new creators, excuse me, that we'll learn about and they'll start, they'll be writing Batman before we know it. And this new creator will be someone with different ideas and be ideas we haven't seen before. I Here. welcome it. And then we get to chase these original uh, books and ideas that are going to be happening in this new venue. I have a question. And I honestly, 
don't know the answer to this and I haven't looked into it. So if anybody has any input in the comments, I would love to hear what is the comic reading experience like on Substack? Because that's something that I haven't seen anywhere. It's a blog as far as I know, which in my mind means that like you're scrolling down through pages versus say a comiXology experience. That's not ideal. Well, I bet the, if I were doing it, and please someone tell me if this is not how it works or how it will work, it would be you subscribe to the Substack, but you download the book or you like you have access to it in a different way. So you're not having to read it page by page on a blog. You probably yeah, can't download know. it because then you have to. You can. It's just that was the thing that, that was surprising like, to me initially about the announcement is that Substack doesn't feel like a natural comic book platform. And that's the thing yeah. that I think is giving people pause. But like you said, People are trying out. They're trying different ways yeah. to distribute their books, to create things, and that's all good. And like, if we talked about this, I think a little bit last week. Pete, remind me if I'm wrong, but things like Donnie and Ryan doing a book, a couple of books, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't just live on Substack. At some point, Dark Horse is going to pick it up and publish it, or Image is going to pick it up yeah. and publish it. That's just how the comic industry works. So there's going to be other ways to read these books. They're just going to get a little more ownership and a little more money uh, off of it initially. Which is I mean, exciting that the, the people creating it are going to have more control over it. That's hopefully what's going to happen. But also what's kind of interesting is we don't know what Substack is going to be like. Hopefully it'll kind of bring some new things to uh, 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 people who want to read comics and can get some uh, younger people also on board or other groups that comics aren't reaching maybe uh, that's the whole I don't know if it's younger people though substack yeah. is older well and i would argue it's people who are following th these are fans already who are following their creators to a more direct line i mean it's like the the podcast gold rush where like it was like following these ideas to a place where you can get them directly without a bunch of production apparatuses getting in the way and so like substack it the the platform well, and just is, to interrupt, is, and eventually it works up to well-oiled machines like our podcast. But go ahead, Justin. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. The true gold rush is right here. <laughs> oh, tink, 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 tink. <laughs> yeah. uh, you can tell Justin's living his best life. A hundred percent. I'm in a basement next to a lawnmower, as I said earlier on. Uh, the but the Substack is more about the subscription model as opposed to the platform. Right? It's just like how you are interfacing directly with the creators and getting access to these books because they know – they don't need a bunch of uh, corporate oversight and editorial handling their books because they've worked, they're professionals. They know how it works. They know how to put these stories together in a way. And they have someone they work with directly that they can just like jump on the book and sort of be that oversight eye. And then they're, they're making that money directly. And it's sort of a, just a better way to interface or a more direct way to interface with the creators you like. So of course it's going to be wildly popular. Now that's how so much media is going. We actually got some input from Isaac Carter over on YouTube about a couple of the different the Substack projects. He says Tynan's book Razor Blades is like what Justin was talking about. You download it and read it how you choose. Um, the panel movies. syndicate model. I yeah, think. Scott Carpenter says he's signed up for all of them. No comics yet. Snyder has been doing a podcast that are six to eight minutes and are great, but that's it so far. Oh, interesting. And then otherwise, they're mostly newsletters. Also, a couple of people have mentioned this. This may have happened actually while we were doing the show or just before, but Chip Zdarsky also announced uh, pretty naturally that he's going to be doing some stuff at Substack as well. So it'll be interesting. I feel like, like we would talk about, it's a Wild West thing. There's going to be a, some organizing principle at some point because that's just how things work in the world, you know? Or at least connectivity between creators who share a, a, an aesthetic. Like, I feel like Scott Snyder and James Tyne and Substacks will relate to each other in a way. Or be like, <laughs> yes. hey, check out this. Check out this one. Like, And all those people, I feel like, know each other and are friends. There's a reason they're all going there because it feels it's like something they've talked about. And, you know, that's cool. I think that's cool. Let's move to some other questions. This is from Kevin, not counting anything written by a guest tonight. What are some of your favorite comics for younger children? Ooh. Mm. Uh, I love the DC, um, like Tiny Titans. Tiny. And all, yeah, those, the, those, it's just, it, it's written uh, by giant kids and you can feel it coming out yeah. of the comic. And it is just... Uh, the, the the people who make those comics, uh, Art Balthazar and those guys, are just 
hysterical, unbelievably creative, unique individuals. And they're, uh, it's just, they found what they're supposed to be doing in life. And it's just yeah, magical. Franco and Balthazar might be drawings that have come to life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's really just magical. I'll throw one out at you that I think you're going to like, Justin. Uh, so my seven-year-old at camp. It, this is going to be, let me just say, is it bone? Yeah. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> my seven-year-old at camp came home one day. It was like, hey, I was reading a, a book at camp. Uh, and I love it, and it's called Bone. And I was like, oh, that's great. And I, in the back of my head, I was like, is he Justin's kid? What's going on here? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, shit. But I, every I day, sort of... he kept coming home and talking about Bone, like, nonstop. You should and get him into finished. classical theater, dude. They just had the first volume of Bone, so he read that and loved it. And he's like, can we buy the rest? And I said, oh, on Free Comic Book Day is coming up. On Saturday, this was last week when I was saying a free comic book day is coming up on Saturday. Why don't we go to like Midtown? We'll get the free books and then we can buy you uh, the rest of Bone. And my son said, Dad, it's not a comic, it's a graphic novel. Wow. Yes. He is he taste? is my son. <laughs> How did that taste? <laughs> anyway, we ended up getting they had a copy Were of the Were you like bone. I know, don't tell me about I've been doing a show <laughs> for years, okay? I know about this. Uh anyway, we picked up the Your bone. son wrecked you, bro. He didn't What's realize he? there was that much bone. He was very excited about it, but when we pulled out, you know, the complete bone was like the yeah. side of a human head. Uh he was like, "Oh, when do you think your kids are going to start listening to our podcast? Because <laughs> I'll tell you what, I gave them the opportunity to come on tonight to talk yeah, to, to Chad talk to because yeah. they love that yes. book. And I was like, hey, do you have any questions for the creator of the Cardboard Kingdom? I said this to my son first. And he was like, no. <laughs> and then I went up to my daughter and was like, hey, kid. well, you're 11 years old. Of course, you probably have some very intelligent questions for the creator of Cardboard Kingdom, a book you love. And she looked at me and I was like, She's like, no. Dad, you do your own work. No. Yeah. Stop trying to steal I was from like, kids. all right, do you have any statements? And she was like, nope. <laughs> Alex, they're not following the family business of asking creators questions about their You don't projects. want to do I invited you to be on a podcast. That's a big deal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you're going to be at the dinner table being like, oh, uh, you all showed up for dinner. But you, know, <laughs> you couldn't show up to ask them questions on the podcast. Uh, but quick shout out to the other comments. Um, my daughter loves Phoebe and her unicorn from Derek Mainhart. Very Calvin Hobbes vibes. And uh, from Sarah without an H, my five-year-old loves Marvel superhero adventures. All good books. Nice. And how long can you make a name on YouTube says Jonah and the Unpossible Monsters, which is running right now, mm. which is great. So yes. that's a great I do love that. The well. Samney, Chris Samney, oh, Samney yeah. family. Yeah, Chris Samney, yeah. Uh, let's see. I think we've, <laughs> uh, got a couple more questions here. Well, let's, uh, let's answer one, one, comic, <laughs> one, one question here. This is from Pablo D. Martinez. And then we'll wrap up with questions. What's the one comic you've read digitally, but you've liked more as a print book and why? And I feel like we're probably all going to have the same answer. Uh, I'm going to say really uh, Batman the, that, uh, the one where he gets lost in the, Yep. 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 Wow. There you go. Yeah. There's that issue of Batman where he gets lost in the night maze owl, of the yeah. court. Uh, court of owls. <laughs> what is your deal with night? In the night grandma's maze? <laughs> she traps him. <laughs> I'm having a tough night. All right. Come on. Oh, it's all good. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, 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 yeah, I agree though issue. with Edward Doherty's answer. All of them. I want yeah. all uh, print comics at the core. Double page spreads just Batman, do not hit. Oh my God. Do not hit in the, in the digital format. Yes, absolutely. They're always going to be better in print. I don't really collect them just for space reasons, and uh, that's pretty much it. But because you're going to space. Spoiler alert. Going to space. 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 And they Pause said, again. hey, we're going to send you to space with all of your stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah. i got to stop collecting comics. That's going to be a lot of stuff. But Yeah. Comics, you don't want your comics space. in space? Space is a great time to read comics. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's my life. That's what's going on with me. And that is it for your audience question. Thank you, audience. We're going to move on with our next section, which is trivia. And for that, we're going to turn it over to Pete 
the page. All Pete right. the page. This is uh, I'm no longer uh, a page, so you can't say that. Um, all right, this is the part we give back to you, the lovely Pete audience. La, Pete the former page. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Zelps, do we have somebody, or are we going to the audience? We don't. We're going to go to the audience for this one. So we need a first hand up guy type of situation. If you're listening on YouTube, if you're on YouTube, just say me, me. I want to do trivia and let us know, though it's going to be at a little bit of a delay. But if you're over here on Crowdcast, just say me or hand up, and we will welcome you into the stream. Oh, we got a hand up. Isaac Carter over on YouTube. Nice. A YouTuber. Isaac, it's going to be a little bit of a delay, which is always very fun. But all you got to do is type the answer into the chat, and we will a, accept a, it. A, B, or C, yeah. P? All right. Yep. Those Take are the letters. Way. We're okay. using the traditional first three letters of the alphabet, <laughs> as you might expect. Great starting point. Or, or Pete, choose random letters. Let's shake it up. All right. Let's all right. go. Take it away, Pete. All right. Today's trivia is on topical comic news. And a small le- uh, nod to the legend. Oh, Isaac says C. Okay, wait for it. <laughs> wait for it, Isaac. A small nod to the legend, uh, Masomi Suda. Uh, so please listen to all three options before making your selection, okay? I already made go. a selection. Question number one. Donny Cates and Ryan Stegman are going to Substack and starting their own publishing imprint called KLC. What does KLC stand for? Is it mm, A, a lot of letters. Kids love comics. B, mm. kids love chains. Or is it C, the Chad? So it's either A, don't pick it, or it's You said B, the Chad? The Chad? The Chad. The Chad, that's right. Uh, so B, the cha- uh, kids love chains is what you want to be saying here. B? Chains? Yep. B, love- he says B. There that's we right. go. Kids love chains. Huh. That's I would have thought it would have been. That's why Spawn's so popular. Kids love chains. Ah, uh, okay. I would have thought it was the first one. Me All too. Right. That's just well, me. Well, you would have been wrong. Good thing you're not taking the quiz. Question number two. DC is partnering with whom to bring you web comics on your phone? Is it A, Webtoon? Is it B, your mom's tune? Or is it C, Walter Santos? So it's either A, and you will be that much closer to $25, or you could pick B or C and be completely wrong. Mm. You said Valter? Valter, yeah. Great name, isn't it? Is that with a V? Yeah. Or are you just zipping into a German pronunciation? No, I'm drunk, but not that drunk. Yeah, Pete does go full German. What are you drinking again? How do you make that recipe? It's yeah, great time to share your recipe. Thing, first thing you do is you take vodka and you dump it in Oh, your wait. Mind. Hold on. You can continue later. Isaac says A, which I believe is correct. That is yeah, correct. correct. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Last one. Which Wonder Woman evolution writer says the character helped her in fighting? Is it A, Elizabeth Holloway Martin, B, Stephanie Phillips, or is it C, Leah Sargent? So it's either A, don't pick it, or it's B, Stephanie Phillips. Ooh, let's see if it's B, that's Stephanie that's Phillips. Continue one. with your recipe in the meantime. Okay, yeah, so, so what we, you do we, is so you're far, pouring we have a vodka. Yeah, you pour vodka in, and then you stop and you think to yourself, that's plenty, but then you pour a little bit more. B, cause... Isaac says B. <laughs> B is correct. All, All right. right, there we go. Congratulations, Isaac. You have won a $25 gift card to Midtown Comics. Just shoot us an email at comicbookclub.com live at gmail.com and we will get that right off to you and i just wanted to uh, quickly share of course uh, everybody realizes i'm uh, getting a nod to the uh, 1995 animated hit tv show street fighter 2 colon 5 i don't know what you're talking about let's move on and talk about new comic (laughs) books that come out this week and every week but what are you looking forward to that's coming out this week. Pete, to you first. Well, uh, you know, me and Justin already talked about Homesick Pilots number eight. Yes. But then to take another one of Justin's, I'm going to say Nightwing number 83. Oof. Good mm. issue, I think. I am assuming. It's out today. You can talk about that one. 
great because it is a great issue. There's a great <laughs> connection moment between um, our boy Nightwing and mm-hmm. a character that I love as well that I thought was really beautifully done. Justin, anything else you want to call out? Um, yeah, you mean uh, my pick? Yeah, yeah, your pick. Yeah, we're gonna call just in general. Do you have anything you, you want to call talk it anything? About? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody uh, you want to put on blast? Yeah, <laughs> yeah this new segment. Um, yes, I want to shout out one of my favorite comics that is back um, after a long gap. Lazarus Risen issue oh, six comes out yes. um, by Greg Rucka and Michael Lark. Love this book. It's a, been a bit more infrequent lately, but the story is still very good. And I'm going to throw out one more because it's the last issue of Ascender, number oh, 18. Yeah. Uh, man, I've loved Descender, Ascender. I just hope they choose another Love direction the to take this story. I mean, not to spoil anything, but there is a little bit of a tease. They might do Return to Sender. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Your dad jokes are awful. I, I hate myself. You should. I am looking forward, though, to Man Eaters the Curse, number two from Image Comics. Mm. This is written by Chelsea Kane, art by Leah Mitternick. And we love the first issue of this. It was so wild and creative and fun and weird. And uh, no spoilers, but the second issue maybe is as well. We're going to have reviews of Dude, all of those things in the heavy. Stack podcast that rolls out in the comic book club feed and its own dedicated stack feed 9 a.m. on Wednesdays. So definitely check all of that out. And folks, that is it for this week's show. Show. A couple of people to thank. We want to thank Mark Crilly for being here. Check out my last summer with Cass from Little Brown and Company. It'll get you right in your heart. Ah. Chad Sell, The Cardboard Kingdom, The Roar of the Beast from Penguin Random House. It'll also get you in your heart in a very significant way, but you could also yeah, share that yeah. with your kids. Beautiful. Next week on the show, we're going to have Shane Berryhill is going to be here to talk about Jason and the Olympians. Also, the stack team of J.H. Williams and W. Hayden Blackman are going to be here Woo. to talk about the new Image Comics book. Echo Land, so that should be pretty awesome. A so couple cool. of other things to plug. Marvel Vision, our Marvel podcast, is talking through What If. Got a new episode posted at 3 a.m. tomorrow, so check that out. Riverdale so After early. Dark, our Riverdale podcast. Big. Nobody's getting up. Uh, come Big on. Uh, we're going to get up. We're going to get up. Riverdale yeah. After Dark, our Riverdale podcast is back talking about new episodes of Riverdale right after they come out. Star Guys, our Stargirl podcast. Guys, we got to jump off because we have an episode going up at 9 p.m. in All 15 right, minutes right now. So we got to go uh, do we're that. We're going to have to speak quickly. we got to speak quickly, but that's going up as well. Patreon.com slash comic book club to support the show. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow at Comic Book Live on Twitter. Comic Book Club Live on Instagram. ComicBookClubLive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, good night, all you good night. night. Grandma! The night that you throw them off and piss me off the lip! Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming out. We appreciate it. Stick around for Pete's recipe hour or minute. <laughs>